parks are the beauty spots of our cities. Urban sanctuaries for nature, people, and culture. We explore five of the most beautiful city parks in Europe in all four seasons. Today, we travel to Munich to explore the Englischer Garten. We meet urban surfers, enjoy an open-air theater performance in summer, and homemade mulled wine in winter. The sun rises over Munich. Right here in the city center lies the southern tip of the Englischer Garden. The park extends along the river Isar as far as the eye can see. With a size of nearly four square kilometers, it's one of the largest urban parks in the world. Munich has this park in its center, which I think is beautiful. It reminds me of the Garden of Eden, a paradise. We lead hectic lives, and we're actually looking for something deeper. We're trying to calm ourselves down. In order to counteract all this stress, all these burnouts, we are trying to return to nature. We try to harmonize and balance ourselves. Tai Chi master Andreas Friedrich and his partner come here early in the morning. On the park's meadows, they practice Tai Chi and Qi Gong. At this early hour, the southern part of the park is still quiet and deserted. The air is very clear and light in the morning. The sunrise and the movements lift you up. These are the reasons why people like to exercise in the morning. Even when the sky is cloudy, it's still blue above. The blue sky opens you up, and yet you're rooted to the earth. All these are things that you can experience in a park. And the Englischer Garten, my God, it's so big. One of the largest parks in Europe or even the world. You can always find a place here to practice Tai Chi and Qi Gong. It's springtime in Munich. A good time to start our journey through the four seasons. At the end of May, the meadows, shrubs and trees are all in full bloom. A colorful spectacle, planted for the enjoyment of the public. When the Englischer Garten opened in 1792, it was the first public park in Europe. While most of the parks at the time were reserved for the aristocracy, this garden was always meant for the people. It was an American who had the idea to create a public park in Munich. Count Rumford, who was born in Massachusetts, was the chamberlain of Prince Karl Theodore. He suggested to create a people's park. The prince liked the idea and ordered his soldiers to drain the swamps east of the city center. The layout of the park followed the English landscape garden ideal, hence the name Englisher Garden, literally meaning the English garden. At its southern tip, narrow, winding paths lead to an exotic fairy tale world. Located on a small island is the Japanese tea house. Here, visitors can attend a genuine Far Eastern tea ceremony and sample its results. 
A few steps further down, the Schwabinger Brook joins the Eisbach stream to form a waterfall, a whimsical feature that was put here to make the park more romantic. A little bit downstream, the Eisbach forms a standing wave. For centuries, nobody was paying any attention to it, until one day... Surfers discovered the spot and turned it into an internationally known wave riding hotspot. In the beginning, it was illegal and the police tried to chase the surfers away, but the fun continued. Today, the Eisbach wave is one of Munich's tourist attractions. And after all these years, surfing it has finally been legalized. When I go surfing, I lose and find myself at the same time. I don't think of anything, but live in the moment. For me, that's surfing. Ben Müller has been coming to the Eisbach since 2010. By now, he's turned his passion into a profession and does surf marketing. He and his buddies come here all year round, thanks to their neoprene suits. Now, during the first hot days in spring, the inner city surf spot gets particularly busy. The wave is always here. Sometimes there's a little more water, sometimes a little less, it depends. When the glaciers of the Alps are melting, the wave can be really good. But if there's too much water, it can get quite flat. But you can surf all the time. Surfing is actually a lifestyle. You live to surf. You grow your hair longer. Perhaps it's a bit cliched, but that's part of the whole thing. Here at the Eisbach, you meet all sorts of people. We have lawyers, bankers, shop assistants and bakers. There are people from all walks of life, with all sorts of jobs. Surfing the Eisbach looks cool and easy, but it requires a lot of practice because the wave is treacherous. There are stones underneath the wave, and when you get drawn under, you can get quite seriously injured. I've seen a few things happen. I also had an accident once myself where I hit my head. Luckily, it wasn't that serious. I wasn't knocked out, but I've got a few scars. So it's not without its dangers. You really have to be careful. Just a few steps away from the wave is Fräulein Gruneis. The kiosk used to be a public toilet, but today it's a food store. Riding the culinary zeitgeist, the food is organic. Cappuccino. A cappuccino with oat milk, please. The southeastern part of the Englischer Garten is closest to the city center. It's the busiest section of the park, but the further north we travel, the more natural and remote it becomes. The northern part of the Englischer Garten, called Hirschau, is separated from the south by a busy road. Bridges and subways connect the two sections. A citizen's initiative has been lobbying for years to build a street tunnel and reunite the two parts. The north of the park looks very different. Its vast woods and meadows are deserted.
It's summer. The grass is long and adds to the wild, untouched aura of the park. Unusual for a city park, a flock of sheep wanders through the Hirschau. They remind us of Count Rumford, who saw the park as a space for both agriculture and recreation. Shepherdess Eva Mittermeier looks after the 300 animals. On some afternoons, she is joined by her little daughter. The sheep have been here in the Englisher garden for more than a hundred years. And we've been here for eight years. If you spend every day with the animals, know their faces and how they move, then you become one with the flock. You care for the flock 365 days a year. There are no holidays, no knocking off time when the animals are sick, and when it's lambing time, then it gets late at night. You have to check their health. You have to notice early signs of sickness in order to prevent diseases. They can get mastitis and sometimes they don't eat or have lung problems. You have to have a feel for it and an eye for it too. The flock in the Hirschau add to the impression that we are in the countryside. People look for the sheep. People want to see the sheep because somehow they belong to the English Garden. Throughout the summer, Eva and her flock roam the park, wandering from meadow to meadow. In the autumn, they move to the countryside, where the flock spends the winter. What I like about the sheep is that we are together with them all year round. We have a symbiosis. The sheep know us. They know our steps. They know exactly when we approach them. They know who we are and that we care for them and offer them protection. They're very grateful and they appreciate that we treat them well. So we get a lot of gratitude from the animals. In the north, the Hirschau extends for more than three kilometers along the river Isar. The name Hirschau in German means deer meadow and indicates that it once had a rich wildlife. Even today, it feels more like a forest than a park. On the eastern edge of the park lies the district of Oberföhring. The houses here are surrounded by lush gardens. This is where Ulrike Dissmann lives. I've never lived without a garden. I'm so fortunate. As a child, I grew up with large gardens. And wherever I lived, be it in London or in Edinburgh or anywhere else, I was surrounded by plants that stuck in my mind. When 
If you live next to the Isar, then all roads to the center lead through the Englische Garten. I know all the roads in the Englische Garten. It's part of my life. The old-fashioned word soul, I'd say. Munich's soul needs the Englische Garten. Ulrike Dissmann works outdoors, surrounded by nature, she stages classical plays by Shakespeare and others. The summer theater productions have been a fixture of Munich's cultural calendar for decades. The performances are free of charge. Ulrike has worked in London and Edinburgh as an actress and a director. When she returned to Munich, she discovered this hidden away amphitheater and decided to awaken the Sleeping Beauty. This is actually the idea of theatre, to be close to the audience. People come for a picnic and they love the simplicity of our productions. Our theatre benefits from the wonderful setting and the beauty of the language must compete against and match the beauty of the surroundings. And the outcome is a very unique form of theatre. The cast is young. These young actors get the chance to work with a large audience. They learn a lot. Some have a lot of professional experience, some are beginners. But our goal is, and usually we succeed, that a tightly knit, loving and caring ensemble creates this wonderful tomfoolery on the meadow. Was zum Henker ficht meine nicht da an, dass sie sich den Tod ihres Bruders so zu Herzen nimmt? Ich bin mir ganz sicher, dass der Kummer ein Feind des Lebens ist. Meiner treue Junker Tobias! Ihr müsst abends früher nach Hause kommen. Eure Nichte, meine Herren, nimmt ausnehmend Anstoß an euren unchristlichen Zeiten. Na und? Soll sie ruhig ausnehmend Anstoß nehmen? Ausgenommen natürlich bei den Ausnahmen. They need to ascertain, this is the scene, this is us. The only props we have are the light and the costumes, and the power of the language. Wollen wir jetzt nicht ein bisschen feiern? Und was sollen wir denn sonst tun, Junker? Sind wir denn nicht im Zeichen des Stiers geboren? Stier? Es steht das nicht für Lenden und Herz? Nein, Junker! Das steht für Waden und Schenkel! Nun zeig mir doch mal, wie du springen kannst! So wird in der Umgangssprache nicht gesprochen. Nobody talks like that. But Shakespeare's language and my purest way of translating it are both a challenge and a luxury that we can play with. And every time a performance was successful, we both exhausted and happy at the same time. Happier than I ever experienced in a normal theater. Als ich es je in einem Guckkastentheater erlebt habe. The artful lightness of the production makes it easy to forget how much heart and soul goes into the performance. The months of rehearsals, the technical challenges of an open air theatre production, and last not least, the constant worries about the weather. You can't have any great concepts. We need to get on stage and recite this text and it needs to work. And it's wonderful every time it happens. During the intermission, the actors hand out lanterns for the audience to illuminate the amphitheater and to use as lights on their way home. For a moment, it's unclear who is performing and who is watching. Theatre out here is somehow closer to the people. I think the more digitalized the world becomes, 
the more we need these seemingly naive approaches. People interacting with people. People performing in front of people. Live action. When the moon is up and people carry our lanterns, then they become like children. And then theatre is what it should be, a childlike art. And it's humbling because human beings are actually not very important in the Englischer Garten. We are at the receiving end of nature, and in this park, nature gives richly, and we give our theatre. Und wir schenken dann München unser Theater. It's Sunday, 6 a.m. At the Chinese Tower, people have been gathering for hours. They have dressed up in traditional costumes for a very special occasion. The Kochelbal. In the early hours of the morning, they dance, drink and eat just like the servants of Munich used to do before they started their day's work. Around 1880, maids, cooks and nannies didn't have much free time. That's why they met on Sunday morning to dance and be merry before going to work. Today, the people of Munich celebrates this old tradition once a year and dress up like the servants of the 19th century. Summer is coming to an end. Autumn arrives in the park. Hans Holtzmann is an institution in the Englischer Garten. Virtually everybody knows him around here. Come rain or shine, the black-clad gentleman and his carriage wait for customers at the Chinese Tower. His passion for horses started early. My mother always said that whenever we saw a horse-drawn carriage, she had to hold me back, or I would have been run over trying to get to the horses. I've always been fascinated by horses, and it's nice that I'm able to work with them. The Englischer Garten is like my second home. I travel all over the city with my horses, but the Englischer Garten is simply the most beautiful place for me. Hans Holtzmann also does weddings and film shoots. And once a year, he takes the Bavarian Prime Minister and his entourage to the Oktoberfest. What I like about my job is that it's almost always fun. No matter where I go, riding through the Englischer Garden or steering a white wedding carriage through the city, everyone says, oh, look, there's a horse-drawn carriage. How nice. Of course, there are some who don't like it and say, what are you doing here holding up the traffic? But in general, people are happy when they see me. When you arrive from the city and suddenly you're in this green oasis, that's beautiful. And I'm really happy that I'm able to drive through here every day. And of course, it's also nice to sit in the beer garden every now and then and have a beer or two. I think all this is simply great. A half-hour carriage ride through the Englischer Garden costs 38 euros. 
probably one of the nicest ways to explore Munich's largest park. Hans Holtzman started working with horses when he was a little boy. He first rode his own carriage when he was 15. Today, he is the only coachman who is allowed to drive his carriage through the Englischer Garten. This is my life. This is my life. I've been doing this for 50 years. And I'm going to do it for as long as I can. Even when I'm 80 years old. As long as I'm healthy, I'm going to drive my coach. North of the Chinese Tower is the Klein Hesselower See. The artificial lake was created around 1800 for purely decorative reasons to enhance the park's natural feel. In most places, it's no deeper than 60 centimeters. In summer, visitors can rent rowing boats here. Now in October, everything is closed for winter. Nearby Schwabing is one of the most expensive areas of Munich. In the 60s, the district was a hotspot for students, bohemians and dissenters. A little bit of this free spirit has survived in the Englischer Garten. In 1999, I started the Express Brass Band together with some friends, because I thought, there are no bands that just march through the streets or the park. And I thought the Englischer Garten was an ideal place to make music. The Express Brass Band has created its very own style of music. Far from playing typical Bavarian umpa beer tent music, they play an idiosyncratic mix of world music and jazz. Wherever they turn up, people start tapping their feet. The band members are doing this for fun, and it shows. How the brass band works? No idea. It just works. It's a bit like an extended family, even if that sounds a bit cheesy. On some days, someone brings their cousin, and a half-brother, and another cousin, and the neighbor. And then suddenly, we're a lot of people. Our first rehearsal room was in the Käferstraße, next to the Englischer Garten. And our idea was to play in the Englischer Garten. Playing outdoors, whether it's in the park or in the city, it's always nice, because you're in direct contact with the people. In the cold and grey season, the band's music seems to act like an antidepressant for passers-by. But doesn't this anarchic sound clash with Munich's notoriously posh attitude? Munich is a very expensive city. But there has always been space for the freaks, for bohemians, for those who are unruly, for those who want to be free. It's funny that I am explaining this, because I grew up in Spain and not in Bavaria. But a common figure of speech here is, I take the liberty. Munich has always had this subculture that contrasted with the traditional culture. 
Somehow they coexist, which is amazing. For example, there's a brass band playing traditional Bavarian music in the Chinese tower. And we are somewhere out there in the park playing our stuff, which is totally different. And has nothing to do with the traditional brass band music. But people accept that. Of course, some say, oh, what kind of music is that? But somehow this is part of the Munich field too. So I think it's true that Munich is a posh city, but it also has a completely different side. The Englischer Garden, a space for counterculture. Part of the brass band's hippie approach to music is that its members discuss the playlist democratically. So the band's repertoire may sound spontaneous and improvised, but in fact it's the result of long and often arduous discussions. We are out and about. We don't use much amplification apart from a megaphone and a mini amplifier for the banjo. Otherwise, we are what we are. We can just set up and start playing. And this fascinates people. People saunter through the park on Sundays and are pleased about a bit of entertainment. The band spends a lot of time touring around Europe and playing at festivals. But on Sunday afternoons, chances are that they are playing for free in the Englischer Garden. The hustle and bustle of the summer season is gone and things are quietening down in the park. The kaleidoscope of colors makes autumn perhaps the most beautiful season in the Englischer Garden. The area around the Klein Hesseloer Lake is home to hundreds of geese. They have found ideal conditions here and procreate happily. Much to the park administration's dismay. Autumn is coming to an end. Winter is approaching. Like icing on a cake, the first snow of winter covers the trees, shrubs and meadows of the park. The Englischer Garden has turned into a fairy tale landscape. On the western edge of the park is the Milchhäusel. In summer this is a beer garden and in winter it's a great place for a hot drink in one of the heated ski gondolas. When we started in 2003, people didn't really know what organic meant. They asked us whether our organic meatloaf was made of tofu. But now they all know what it means and they just love organic products. The idea of an organic beer garden quickly took off. In summer, we have the typical Bavarian beer garden fair with homemade potato salad and different bratwurst varieties. And in winter, we have mulled wine, of course. Our speciality is blackcurrant mulled wine, which we make ourselves. We boil a mixture of different spices, cloves, cinnamon, vanilla, aniseed, a bit of cardamom for spiciness. 
cardamom für die Schärfe. We use this to refine the blackcurrant wine and turn it into mulled wine. Johannes Bewein und machen daraus den Glühwein. Er ist sehr It's very, very fruity and slightly bitter because of the black currants. It's not as Christmassy as our other mulled wines. I personally prefer a really nice fruity mulled wine, which is a bit sharper. When Axel Bansamir and his partner took over the kiosk, it was pretty run down. With their concept of strictly organic food and drink, they managed to attract a young urban clientele. Customers appreciate that everything is handmade and locally sourced, and are prepared to pay extra for it. During his breaks, Axel enjoys walking in the English garden to clear his head. This is the best workplace I can imagine. Maybe you know this, you're somewhere on vacation and you think, wow, I would like to work here. Well, this is what we have here, right in the middle of Munich. More than 300 years after it first opened, the park still acts as a haven of peace and tranquility. The English Garden has been created artificially in the middle of this city. The English landscape style conveys a bit of freedom, like nature being left to its own devices. But that's not true. Everything is planned. People come here and say, everything is so beautiful and yet natural. I like that. And I say, why don't you go down to the river? And they say, ah, that's too unkempt. So you see how important this man-made design is and how much people love and accept it. Thomas Costa is the park's administrative director. Nobody knows the English garden better than him. Costa wants to preserve the great vision of the park's founders and protect the park's flora and fauna. It's this harmony that our souls need, even today, even in these big cities. You leave the concrete blocks behind and enter a space that is both natural and designed by man. That somehow creates peace and harmony. I think that our work in the English Garden can contribute to this. Part of Costa's job is to shape and preserve the landscape of the park. As head of the park's administration, he has to decide which trees are in line with the overall concept and which ones aren't. Then Costa's employees resort to the chainsaw. Most of this work is done on winter mornings because many people don't understand why trees need to be felled. Costa tries to create a piece of nature that we perceive as beautiful and relaxing. The transition between the forest edge and the meadow, this is what we perceive as idyllic. We find this a lot in the English Garden. It's an important design element. It's hard to believe, but every single tree here in the English Garden is registered, at least in the southern part. That's about 10,000 trees, like a real-life landscape painting. You can get lost here. It can happen, especially to people who have a bad sense of direction, because it extends for quite a few hundred meters here. Das 
The basic principle in the English garden is that there are no repetitions. This creates excitement. We achieve this by always presenting new focal points to visitors that make them curious and eager to continue. Nothing must be repeated, otherwise it gets boring. I feel that I can moderate certain developments or even prevent them. We haven't turned the English garden into an amusement park just because it's fashionable. Instead, we want to preserve a piece of history and make it timeless. We have five and a half million visitors every year, and that shows us that we're up to date with this park, and have been for centuries. So it doesn't lose its appeal. On the contrary, it's becoming increasingly attractive. And that too shows that our concept of a neutral platform, so to speak, is the right way forward. Meadows, woodlands, artificial lakes and winding paths. Even today, the classic concept of the English landscape garden provides stress relief and happiness for townspeople. The Englische Garten in Munich and other large urban parks are a reflection of our yearning for nature and comfort and a little glimpse of the Garden of Eden. The sun is getting stronger. Temperatures rise and spring approaches. Our journey through the four seasons in the Englische Garten comes to an end, and a new cycle of life begins. <laughs>